Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to discover your inner genius, then do we have the How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci show for you. Today I'll be talking with Michael Gelb, a world-leading authority on the application of genius thinking and the author of at least 15 books on creativity and innovation, including another all-time favorite of mine on changing how you think and your brain, the international bestseller, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how you can think like Leonardo da Vinci and seven steps you can take to genius each and every day. That, plus we'll talk about confusion endurance, the importance of dragons, box mass and B minor, drawing music and hearing colors, hmm, Grandma Roser in synesthetic minestrone, (laughs) and what in the world happened to Ludovico Sforza's kitchen. (laughs) Gotcha. So welcome back to the show, Michael. Are you ready to shine? Absolutely. You are the king of the introduction. I got to tell you, you really bring it on, man. That's fabulous. (laughs) I like to set the stage and, and I think Leonardo would approve because while he was very serious about what he did, he wasn't very serious about life. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, He loved jokes, and he understood intuitively the relationship between humor and creativity. The ha-ha and the aha are first cousins. (laughs) Woohoo! <laughs> so, so let's take the the aha, the ha ha, and the woohoo. Let's right. go back in time, way back in time. Who were your superheroes growing up? Well, Leonardo da Vinci and Superman. And I remember when I found out that Superman was only a comic book character, mm-hmm. but Leonardo da Vinci was real, and he just seemed to embody all human potentiality. So at first he was just a personal role model for me, but then I got invited to teach people about how to think creatively. And I started telling stories from Leonardo's notebooks. People seem to really resonate with those stories. So way back actually in the early nineties, I was speaking for this group called Young Presidents Organization. Mm -hmm. They're company presidents from all over the world. And I was talking to them about creativity and innovation at one of their big events. They call them universities. And this event was happening in Washington, D.C. But I knew they were holding one of these premier events in Florence, Italia, Uh my favorite city. And I really wanted to get invited. So I imagined a scenario. I imagine that the education chairman for Florence could possibly approach me and that he might say something like, hey, if we were to invite you to Florence, what would you do? I figured he'd probably say something along the lines of, we want something really special because a lot of people want to go to Florence. Well, I finished my talk in DC. Gentleman approaches me. He says, I'm the education chair for Florence. He says, If we were to invite you, what would you do? And he says, I'm not making this up exactly. He says, we want something really special because everybody wants to go to Florence. So I looked him right in the eye and I just said, how about how to think like Leonardo da Vinci? And he said, can you really do that? And I said, sure. So I had six months to make it up. (laughs) <laughs> but Let the research begin. <laughs> exactly right. But I wasn't just making it up out of the blue because Leonardo really was my childhood hero. I'd been studying him for years. So this was my chance to immerse myself in the mind of the greatest genius who ever lived. I went to the place he was born. I went to the place he died. I walked in his footsteps I looked at the world literally from his point of view. I stood in the places where I knew he stood, looked out of his window of the castle where he spent the last three years of his life under the patronage Mm -hmm. of the King of France. And I, I really aimed to put myself into his mindset. 
And of course, reading his notebooks over and over and over again, I, but I read them with a question in mind. What can we learn from him? How can we translate his wisdom, his advice to his students into our contemporary lives? And from that investigation, seven principles emerged. And that summer, I wrote, I wrote a paper, which I sent to the Young President's Organization so they could introduce me in Florence. And I also sent my biography. But true story, the person introducing me confused the two documents, leading to the most amazing, <laughs> unforgettable introduction I ever received, went something like this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests, here at the Young President's Organization, we've had many extraordinary resources, but never have I had the privilege and the pleasure to introduce someone with a resume like this. Anatomist, architect, botanist, city planner, designer, engineer, painter, sculptor, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Gelb. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning. And then got such a positive reception, I thought, I really need to translate this into a book. Mm -hmm. And so I worked on it for the next four years and How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, Seven Steps to Genius Every Day came out in 1998. So yep. we're looking at the 19-year anniversary of the book. Beautiful, beautiful. So I want to dive deep into this book as, as much as we can get in the hour we have today. But before we do that, I, I want to talk about something that to me is a crime. And, and it's a crime because when kids take this, it sets them on different paths for life when it, it absolutely positively should not. What can you tell us about the IQ test? Ah, yes. <laughs> you're going, where is he going? <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 at this point, I know that wherever you're going, is going to be fun and intriguing and useful for everyone. So IQ test was a noble, it was a noble attempt to try to calibrate people's gifts to help empower them. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it just became a way of putting people in a limiting box. And it's because at the time the IQ test was evolved, we didn't really understand that there were different types of intelligence. Mm -hmm. IQ test just measures verbal intelligence and mathematical intelligence. So when I went to school, there was really only one kind of intelligence. You were either smart or you were dumb. You were either good at school, got high scores on those kinds of tests, mathematics mm -hmm. or verbal, or you were just considered dumb. Didn't matter if you were really good at fixing things, mechanical intelligence. If you were really good at getting along with other people, interpersonal intelligence. If you had profound insights into the meaning of life, spiritual intelligence. If you were incredibly gifted at playing music, musical intelligence. If you were a tremendous athlete or a phenomenal juggler, kinesthetic intelligence. So we now know, thanks to the research of Howard Gardner, that who wrote this wonderful book called Frames of Mind, mm -hmm. that there are at least seven types of intelligence. There may be many more. But here's the best news. When we were growing up getting IQ tests, we were told your IQ is fixed, it's set, and there's nothing you can do about it. But what we've learned since then is not only are there many types of intelligence, mm -hmm. but they can all be developed. Wow. Well, that is a life-changing idea. Wherever you are on the spectrum and whatever kind of intelligence you have naturally, mm -hmm. you can develop it further and you can develop these other intelligences. So if you are a parent, you've got a, a potential Leonardo da Vinci. So we can use the principles from the study of Leonardo. And why Leonardo? Because he was a genius in all of these areas. What's fascinating to me, though, is when you say he's a genius in all these areas, my guess is he wouldn't have done so well in his early years in school. He didn't. No, there's uh, 
Vasari wrote this classic. It's the first book of art history. Mm -hmm. It's called The Lives of the Artists. And one of the artists profiled, of course, is Leonardo da Vinci. And Vasari explains that the young Leonardo got in trouble in school because he asked too many questions. <laughs> Thomas Edison's mother had to take him out of school because his teacher said his brain is addled. She homeschooled him. Einstein had to find a special school that allowed him to follow his amazing imagination. He wouldn't sit still. He also asked too many questions. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be fabulous if we could reorganize schools along the principles of genius, along the principles of how to think like Leonardo da Vinci. And this is part of my mission. So I actually work with schools. I work with educators. I recently came back from New Mexico where mm -hmm. I gave a, a benefit event to try to raise money for da Vinci education throughout the state. I did a day with New Mexico educators, teaching them the seven principles. Our vision there is to certify all the educators in the state to utilize the principles in the book to help children grow up thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. And really, you know, my mission is to get this in schools around the world. But in order for that to happen, first we have to teach teachers. We got to get parents involved. And my vision is to get companies to sponsor all this. So when it's happened, it's been because we've had corporate donors who help us. But, but part of my life vision mission goal is get the seven principles for thinking like Leonardo as described in the book mm -hmm. in the school systems around the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is so important. And we'll dive into parents and kids many times throughout this discussion. Let's go into the seven principles. Let's talk about the first one. And I'm, I'm going to uh, butcher my Italian today, but I'll do the best I can. Uh, curiosita. Sita. <laughs> Excellent. So I had fun with these because once the first challenge was what legitimately really are the da Vinci principles? Mm -hmm. And, and they're all drawn from a very careful study of his notebooks, from things that are really clear. And in, in the book, in each chapter, I give you the background as to you know, why the first principle, why the second principle, why the third principle. Leonardo is probably the most curious person who ever lived. His notebooks are filled with all kinds of questions. So then I thought, well, in tribute to Leonardo, we really do want to have these in Italian. And the good news is that Italian sounds a lot like English, at least when these words are, are, are concerned. We can make sense of them. So, of course, the first principle in English is curiosity. Mm -hmm. And in Italian, it is curiosità. And you always want to use a gesture, pretend you're really Italian. Curiosità. Curiosità. Grazie. <laughs> Prego. And in, in Spanish, it's curiosidad. Curiosidad. Curiosità, curiosity. It's our birthright. Every child is born wildly curious. Mm -hmm. They're asking questions all the time. They're also profoundly imaginative, mm -hmm. and they have more energy than anybody else. But then they go to school and they start learning that answers are more important than questions. And their curiosità becomes dulled, dimmed. So one way to think about a personal renaissance, if you're, if you're a grown-up, is how do I reawaken that natural curiosity, my birthright? And it goes hand in hand with wild imagination mm -hmm. and a resurgence of your life energy. Woohoo! So, <laughs> I want to talk about some of the ways that we can really crank this up, but strategically, you put it first. Why is that? 
Well, it is our birthright. It's what we're born with. And it leads to all the other principles. It leads to reading the rest of the book. It leads to <laughs> doing all the exercises. So it's, it's, it is the first principle for a reason because it is the motive power of mm -hmm. learning, growth, change, evolution, creativity, innovation, Beautiful. So on that note, let's talk about how we can crank it up. I have here a couple of my, wow, this one doesn't show up so well in the green screen. Kind of cool. I, I have several of my notebooks. I'm writing in my notebooks all the time. I'm spending an hour each morning in, in stream of consciousness. I call it automatic writing. I call it the awe experience, automatic writing experience. What's the importance first off of keeping a journal or a notebook? Well, If people consider, I love asking this question, I've asked it to people all over the world for decades, where are you physically located when you get your best ideas? Where are you actually physically located? Well, the number one answer around the world is in the shower. People also say in the bath, mm -hmm. resting in bed, walking in nature, or driving in their car. Almost no one ever says they get their best idea at work. What's happening in the shower or in nature that's not happening at work? Well, we're born with this unlimited curiosity, this wild imagination, this incredible energy. We go to school and we're told to color in the lines, not to ask too many questions, to focus on answers instead to be well behaved, not to play around so much. <laughs> you know, both of us are going to have to kick ourselves outside and go play after this interview. That's right. <laughs> so work is like school for a lot of us. We are there trying to get the right answer. We don't want to be embarrassed. You know, you're a little kid in school, second, third grade, you raise your hand, ooh, ooh, teacher, teacher, call on me, call on me. And that child blurts out a really creative question. Hmm. All too often what happens is the teacher says, no, that's a silly question. It's not in the state mandated curriculum. And, and all the other kids go, never, ever, ever do that again. So for a lot of people, their job is an environment like school where the number one priority is just don't get embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So even though the company or the boss or the CEO says, we want you to be creative, we want you to be innovative, people have learned, figure out what's the right answer. Don't raise your hand. Play it safe. And that's not conducive to creativity or full self-expression or innovation or happiness. So when, when people are in the workplace, it's good to exchange ideas. It's good. I mean, I, I, this is who I work with companies who are trying to change this and trying to create more openness and curiosity and playfulness and interaction and mm -hmm. exchange. And, uh, and there are lots of wonderful organizations out there who I have the pleasure and privilege of working with to help them share these ideas and make this part of their culture. But for a lot of people, they don't work in that kind of company and their, their creativity gets, gets blocked in the course mm -hmm. of working for years in that kind of environment. But then they go for a walk or they wake up at four o'clock in the morning or they're in the shower and they're relaxed and their mind is free and they're by themselves. So they're not afraid of embarrassment mm -hmm. and they come up with their best ideas. So the simple practical way to enhance your curiosity, take it to the next level is write it down in your notebook. Now this is exactly what Leonardo tells his students, carry a little notebook with you wherever you go and write down your ideas. Now, this would be something worth paying attention to if Leonardo was the only one who told us to do this. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that this is the exact same advice that Thomas Edison gives to all the people who work in his laboratory. 
it's hard to find an example of a genius throughout all of human history who didn't keep a notebook and who didn't advise their students to do the same thing. Now, we know Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. They're world famous. Bill Gates paid $30.8 million for 18 pages of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks in, in 1994. And people can get my book for only $14 on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so keeping a notebook, very seriously, keeping a notebook, what it does, well, let's look at it this way. You wake up at four o'clock in the morning, yeah. you're Leonardo da Vinci, and you have this wacky idea. Mm -hmm. You write it down. Mm -hmm. You're Thomas Edison. You wake up at four o'clock in the morning, you have a crazy idea, you write it down. If you're Leonardo da Vinci, what you wrote down be, is in the museums of the world. If you're Thomas Edison, it became 1,093 United States patents, three entirely new industries that made billions and billions and billions of dollars and countless people happy. Right? Light, music, recording industry, and the movies. Those are the three industries invented by Thomas Edison. All began as doodles in his notebook. And by the way, M Marie Curie says the same thing. Charles Darwin says the same thing. You can't find a genius who didn't keep a notebook. So problem is average person wakes up at four o'clock in the morning with a kind of crazy idea. And they say, oh, I'm no genius. And they just go back to sleep. So do what Leonardo advises. Do what Edison advises, what Curie advises. Keep your notebook with you wherever you go. And if you want to do a digital notebook, if you need to send little texts to yourself, that's okay. It's better to do it by hand. Why do I say it's better? Because the brain mechanisms that get engaged when you write by hand are more robust. You'll be calling on different aspects of mind when you keep your own notebook by hand. And this will inspire your creativity uh, to a whole other level. I, I have to go there. We'll double back. I don't mean to hop, skip, and jump us around, but but I can't resist. Is that a mind map I was sneaking a peek uh -huh. at there, Michael? Yo, you absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. This is a, so the way we roll is put that up nice and close to the yeah, camera there for a second. We, th this is just this is just my mind map of stuff I it need to do today. Yep. Uh, and here's my mind map of a business meeting I'm having with a colleague tomorrow and some of the awesome. issues for us to deal with. Uh, and I mean, my, my desk, it's, all there are here are just mind maps. This is the mind map of my next book that I just started working on with, with a colleague. So first of all, not only do you not need to apologize with me for skipping around, <laughs> But I advocate skipping around. <laughs> well, you got uh, it. Skipping around is what it's all about. The key thing is then to be able to come back later mm -hmm. and put it in order. But skip around first is actually one of the secrets of getting out of the proverbial box, liberating your creativity. And one of the ways, one of the most profound ways of doing it is the automatic writing approach that you have explored and evolved and developed. So it's actually one of the two most profound ways for getting genius ideas. The other one is mind mapping. And if you do them together or back and forth, then you're synergizing and, and, and optimizing at a whole other level. So mind mapping was originated by my friend Tony Buzan. Mm -hmm. And Tony will tell you that he was inspired to create mind mapping by studying the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci and Thomas Edison. So I, I wrote How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci started as a mind map. Yeah. You mentioned that I've written 15 books. I'm working on number 16. You can see that number 16 starts as a mind map. Number one was my master's thesis. It started as a mind map. Mind mapping is a really practical, powerful, 
transformational tool for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. And, and what, you know, I've been teaching people how to do this in seminars and workshops around the world for years. It's, it's so powerful. I'm just, I'm just looking up what we, what we did here in, in the book is take people through a step by step course in how to make a mind map. And then uh, one of the last exercises in the book is called make a master mind map of your life. Because it's one thing to talk about Leonardo's general advice. Mm -hmm. And it's another thing to have a method, practical method, to really integrate the artistic and the scientific aspects of your mind, the logical and the imaginative aspects of your mind. Mind mapping really does that. It's a tool for really thinking like Leonardo da Vinci. Then if you're keeping notebooks and, and making mind maps, you will, you will discover that you are way, way, way more creative and productive. Plus, it is so much fun. It's so Woo-hoo. much fun. Yay. <laughs> can, can you give me I'm, – I'm having deja vu moments here. I wrote a book for students with uh, attention deficit disorder and learning disabilities many years ago. And I talked about how to work with what I called your hyper-creative mind. And, and we listed Edison and Einstein and da Vinci. And we went into mind mapping. And I'm going doo-doo-doo-doo <laughs> here. Because what you're talking about is, is a completely different way that we can all, all harness the genius that's what's inside of us. Right. And, and what's great about this, too, is let's say you are on the ADD or AHD side of the spectrum, or let's say you have a mind that wanders around a lot, or you're considered to be highly creative, or, well, what mind mapping does for those kinds of children and adults mm-hmm. is it liberates them. It gives them a chance to express themselves, to utilize all their energy, to put it in a form that is just so engaging to to people with that kind of mind. And then it helps them to organize their thinking so that they can really apply it in the world as we know it. But here's the other side of this. Mm -hmm. I mostly have earned my living and continue to do so helping people from the opposite side of the spectrum. I work, I just did a a, a talk about how to think like Leonardo da Vinci at the Exponential Medicine Conference sponsored by Singularity University for an audience of some of the most brilliant thinkers PhDs, MDs, MBAs. My clients over the years are engineers. They are people who come to me and they say, I am a very logical, linear, step-by-step thinker, and I don't know how to be creative. Well, those people experience a phenomenal explosion of the creative power they didn't even know they had. It, they get liberated and start generating all sorts of new ideas And they're already gifted at putting it in order and and being logical. We just have to get them out of doing that prematurely. So whichever side of the spectrum you're on, if you're more all over the place to start with, this will help you feel liberated, free, and then you can integrate and organize easily. If you're more on the organized side of the spectrum, it's going to get you into a whole new dimension of expression and playfulness and fun. So either way, you discover that you really can think like Leonardo da Vinci. Woo! <laughs> well, I want to jump on to number two, but before I do that, can you give us like just a couple sentences for those people who are listening who can't see any of those maps of what it looks like or how you start building a mind map? A mind map, sure. Mind map starts with an image in the center of the page. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's all sorts of computer programs for mind mapping. Some of them are wonderful. But what I'm talking about is artisanal mind mapping. Grab some colored pencils. That is with with colored pens. I have them all over here. Colored pens. uh, uh, 
uh, <laughs> colored pens. I have them all here. Uh, big sheets of paper. I have yep. them all here. Uh, I have whiteboards in the office here where I'm making more mind maps. So big sheet of paper, colored pens. Mm -hmm. Instead of starting at the top of the page and going down in linear order, which is what we learned in school, a lot of us learn to make outlines. Look, outlines are great. After all the real thinking has been done. Thank An outline you. is a tool for sharing information. If you try to think that way, you'll, you'll be locked in. That is the box. Mm -hmm. It's premature organization. It prevents conception. It slows you down and locks down your imagination. So we'll use it later after we generate all the ideas. So the mind maps are much more efficient, effective, enjoyable way to generate, generate ideas. So big sheet of paper, start with a picture in the center that represents your topic. Well, people say, I can't draw. That's why at the, at the back of How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, there is the Da Vinci Drawing Course, where I take you step by step how to draw, which I learned how to do myself because I thought I couldn't draw either, and I learned, and so can anybody and when you learn to draw you are drawing on a part of your brain that for a lot of us is dormant and it's so important to learn to do this yourself by hand because it's just not the same to click somebody else's icon on a mind mapping program or an emoji on a text as much fun as that is learn to draw with your own hands your own eyes well, it's important what you're talking about, and, and, and I'm going to go back. I'm going to give it another try to get into drawing. I'm still scarred. I can't really blame them at this point. It's my own choice, but I had a um, Catholic high school, had a brother who sent me to the, to the headmaster, to the head father, because he said, you can't possibly be that bad at drawing. You must be doing it just to piss me off. <laughs> 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 oh, that God, was it for it. my drawing. <laughs> right. No, but see, I love it. See, but that, see, but it's, this doesn't surprise me that we have such similar experiences, uh, because my when I was whatever grade it was, kindergarten or first grade, we were all assigned to draw airplanes. Yeah, and my teacher took my airplane and oh, hung no. it up as an example of what airplanes are not supposed to look like. Oh, no. So, no, so a lot of my work, a lot of why I became committed to create this renaissance in education, write these books, came from all of these terrible teachers who just taught me the opposite of – they. so I was traumatized and I thought I would never learn to draw. I, I'm going to give you one more. English Please. class, senior year, I couldn't, quote, unquote, pay attention to this really boring – Teacher, I cracked out. I brought with me a notebook. I brought with me stencils, and I made these awesome Escher-esque kind of drawings that I never showed anybody else. Geometric patterns and infinity symbols looping back into themselves. And on the last day of class, he says, "If you want to graduate and go to college, you'll give me your notebook, and you'll never see it again." This was see what's so wonderful. I see. I love these. That's how I about. focused. Yes. These are the people who've inspired us to champion the creative process and the process of helping every child develop their gifts. And you know, those, those poor teachers, they're just doing the best in a very limited framework, which is just all they knew. They thought they were trying to help you and protect you from being unable to function in – in a world. Unfortunately, the world that they were trying to prepare you for doesn't even exist any anymore. And, and the kinds of thinking that we're talking about turn out to be more relevant now than ever before. And I, I had this experience, not just with drawing, I told you the airplane story, yeah. I had it with singing. My, it was the same kind of thing. The class was singing, it was choir day at school or something, and my teacher stopped the class pointed to me as the person who was singing out of tune, made me get up in front of the class to 
prove how bad I was. Oh, so Michael. I thought as a little child, I thought, I'm never going to draw. I'm never going to sing. And it gets mm -hmm. worse. Uh, at camp, one of my counselors, I was afraid of deep water. Mm -hmm. So my counselor threw me in the water and I almost drowned. So for years, I couldn't swim. I couldn't sing. I couldn't draw. Moreover, I was sure I would never, ever do those things. And when I was just emerging into the study of the mind and creativity and reading from so many wonderful sources, Abraham Maslow, Victor Frankl, Rollo May, Carl Jung, J.G. Bennett. I was reading these people in my teens, and I was saying, there's a better way. Mm -hmm. there's, another, uh, there's another path here. So I, I'm a lifetime student of, of this path. And then as part of my process that led to the writing all of the books, I learned how to draw. I learned how to sing. I learned how to swim. I, I remember the moment when I, I, I swam a mile yeah. and then I did an extra couple of laps uh, just to prove that I could do it. And I realized I could learn anything that I wanted to learn. And I realized that there was an approach to learning that was the most valuable thing that anyone could learn. Cause I knew the world was changing so quickly mm -hmm. that the most important thing that we could teach children and grownups was how to learn. So my work really began with this powerful focus on how to learn. And that's when I came back to Leonardo. Well, if you want to learn to be creative, he's, he's the supreme role model, but it's all about understanding that you can learn whatever you want to learn. You can, you can learn in all those intelligences. You can go back and take the things you thought you weren't good at, and we can show you how to get really good at them. And then you feel this amazing power like wow i can do any i can do whatever i want to do and then you look at your child and you say i can help you learn anything you want and so don't we want schools that are like that don't we oh, want yeah. companies that are like and we need them now because the technology is changing so fast the uh, uh, the organizational structures are changing so quickly our world is shifting there's so much unbelievable information that's available to us so how do you think for yourself in this challenging crazy world well that just turns out to be the next principle for thinking like leonardo <laughs> so so let's i i'm gonna resist bouncing us no no i can't resist it first off <laughs> real briefly what you're talking about about bringing art in about bringing music in and this doubles back to something later in the book but you're talking about bridging the hemispheres of the brain and not being so one-sided or in uh, uh your terms for what leonardo would say half-witted in our thoughts Thoughts. Right. Right. Well, this so the fifth principle for thinking like Leonardo is arte scienza, art and science in harmony. And that's why we think of Leonardo as the greatest genius because he's a genius artist, some of the greatest artworks of all time and he was a scientist far ahead of his time and a genius inventor. You know, he invented the parachute before anybody could fly. That is thinking ahead. So when we look at science, technology, engineering, and math, many of my clients sponsor what they call STEM initiatives. They want to promote science, technology, engineering, and math. However, the this, this significant research here and what it shows really clearly is scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians who are also artists – are better at science, better at technology, better at engineering, and better at math. So part of my mission is to turn STEM into STEAM, science, technology, <laughs> engineering, arts, and math. 
And Leonardo da Vinci is history's supreme role model for the power of STEAM, the integration of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So if you look, there's a, a graph I use in my presentations, especially to engineers. I showed it a couple of weeks ago at the Exponential Medicine Conference. I showed it to the Emerson, Emerson Electric Global Conference. I had 2,000 engineers, and I showed them this graphic. And it said, okay, here's the average engineer, for example. Engineers who are members of the National Academy of Science mm -hmm. are 1.7 times more likely to have an artistic pursuit. In England, the Royal Academy of Science, 1.8 times more likely to have an artistic pursuit. And Nobel laureates are yeah. 2.8 times more likely to have an artistic pursuit than the average scientist, the average engineer. So what was fascinating is when I shared this with the people from Emerson Electric, they, they came running up to me with so much enthusiasm. They, they had books for sale. I signed every single, we sold out of books in 20 minutes. I signed a few hundred books for them because you could see that, you know, their dream, what they would rather be a genius engineer. Wouldn't you rather be a genius scientist or more like a genius in whatever you do? Well, if you want to be that, no kidding, integrate these two modalities, art and science. Ooh. Steam is the way to roll. Let's let's roll with some steam and let's roll with a head of steam and we're going to get through these these uh, six although we kind of touched on one more there and then I've got to double back to mind mapping because at the end if people if I don't do that people are going to go Michael you cut him off while he was telling us how to mind map two dimostrazione <laughs> okay so here we'll do a quick overview of the whole thing so everybody gets the the big picture first is curiosità self explanatory at this point keep a notebook. Second, dimostrazione, think for yourself. Learn to look at things from different perspectives. More important today than ever before. Consider thoughtful representations of ideas that you may disagree with and positions you disagree with. So you can really say you have thought about an issue. Be an independent thinker. Third, sensazione, sharpen all your senses. Leonardo said, the senses are the ministers of the soul. Mm. Fourth, sfumato, sfumato. It's a term that art critics coined to refer to the hazy, mysterious quality you see in Leonardo's paintings, mm. like the Mona Lisa, for example. And what it represents is one of the most distinguishing characteristics of highly creative people, which is their ability to embrace the unknown. Fifth, arte scienza balance logic and imagination, make mind maps. Sixth, corporalita, balance the body and the mind. Leonardo gives advice on health and wellness and strengthening your energy throughout your life, which is as relevant today as it was when he shared it with his students 500 years ago. And then the seventh principle, connezione, everything connects to everything else, be a systems thinker, Look for patterns, relationships, make connections. So those are the seven principles. Now we have the whole framework, and I'm happy to go in more depth to any one that you like. All right. So let's let's go right back to to the second one here. Let's go to dimostrazione, and and let's talk about getting past prejudices of what we've been taught. Yes. Well, we all have prejudices and preconceptions. It's part of the way our brains are hardwired. We will tend to fall into positions to not challenge our beliefs. That's why we need to be educated. <laughs> that's why we need to read and think and learn. And that's why we need to go out of our way mm -hmm. to consider various points of view. This is, this is advice Leonardo gives to his students. He says, look, we're all subjective. So we tend to just confirm our own beliefs, but that is not how science is meant to be. That is not what thinking really is. So most people are just doing what William James called rearranging their prejudices. Mm -hmm. That's what most people call thinking. So 
let's say you're an atheist. You want to consider the most well thought out, intelligent view for God that you can, or vice versa. Let's say you are confirmed member of whatever religion. You want to think through and get a representation of the most thoughtful representation of other religions mm-hmm. and of atheism and and really listen to it and really think about it because only then will whatever beliefs you hold be predicated on real thinking and not just on what you've been conditioned to believe this obviously goes for political issues it goes for a new business development meeting with a business where we're all getting together and trying to think of new ideas just question challenge ideas If you are in an organization and you want to be innovative, but everybody on your team is from the same background, went to the same kind of school, has the same orientation as you, you're probably not going to be that innovative because you're all looking at the world from the preconceptions and prejudices that come with that background. So... Demonstrazione means demonstration. Demonstrate it in your own thinking, in your own critical thinking. So we start with wild, open curiosity. We question everything, and then we think it through really critically. And again, this is not just Leonardo. Edison says the same thing. Edison says, if something worked, I was always suspicious. I like it. <laughs> let's let's go from there. Let's talk real briefly about sensazione, and and um, let's talk about the importance of of enriching our lives, enriching our environments. As I went downstairs and spent time with the kitty cats after reading your book this morning, we were all listening to box mass in B minor. Fabulous, wonderful. Well, I made a list of my favorite pieces of music and explain why I like them. We actually made a CD out of it. And it's one of the exercises in the Sensazione chapter. And do this in different genres. Make your list of the music you like the most. Ask your partner, your husband, your wife, ask your kids, ask your colleagues at work or your friends to make their list of their favorite music. And then play it for one another. And listen and then share why you like it. This is wonderful on a couple of levels. First of all, you'll wind up listening and enjoying some really beautiful music. Second of all, you learn something about the other person, why they chose this music that you might have never known. Mm-hmm. It's, it's in a wonderful way to bond with somebody in your personal life. We also do this as a team building exercise for, for clients. And it's a phenomenal opportunity to discover something really deep and Amazing about another person. Wow, I had no idea you knew about that music or liked that music. And and even sometimes when you have the same favorite music, you find out somebody else likes it for a different reason than you do. Mm -hmm. And now you appreciate the music in a new way. And we do the same thing with art, uh, with food, with wine, with chocolate, with dance, with any aspect of life. Because part of what Leonardo teaches us He says, if you want to be more creative, surround yourself with beauty and consciously appreciate that beauty, explore the essence of what is beautiful and how and why it moves you, and then share that with others. And in our world today, the default setting isn't transcendent, eternal beauty. You're going to have to go out of your way. But, it, but the good news is you can get access to transcendent universal beauty for free and almost instantaneously. So if you want to hear some different versions of Box Mass and, and B Minor, they're pretty much available. Just click on them and find them and listen to them and or whatever genre you like. And what a way to spend – You know, this is now available to all of us uh, all the time. You can listen to the greatest music the poetry of the world's traditions, the literature, the philosophy, 
it's it's all there for us, but you've got to curate your mind really carefully because what's going to come up on your feed isn't going to be transcendent beauty. Mm -hmm. It's going to be some seductive thing trying to sell you something and prey on your reptilian brain and your fear. So you have to kick in your higher cognitive centers when you do the search. What you're talking about when we talk about well, any of the senses, smell, taste, what we're listening to, what we're talking about is increasing and being discerning of what we choose is increasing the nutritional value of what we put into our senses. Yes. Yes. Well, that, I mean, that is, is what, how to think like Leonardo da Vinci is, so it'll keep you busy for the next 10 years. I mean, that was my goal. I mean, somebody once wrote to me, said, there's too many exercises in this book. I can't get through them. I said, you're not supposed to get through them. He said, this will take me 10 years. I said, exactly. Uh, at least. I, I hope it'll keep you busy for the rest of your life, exploring exquisite dimensions of, of beauty. And this is, you know, this is great stuff you can just do with your family. I, I had a client. He was running his business. He was inspired by the book. Uh, he saw me at a, a YPO uh, presentation, but his, his business was so demanding at the time. It was very hard for him to travel. He wanted to travel. He wanted to take his family to Italy. I said, okay, look, I, I, I do advise you set the time and bring your family to Italy. But in the meantime, let's bring Italy to your family. So listen to music, listen to opera in Italian, listen to the greats do a, a thematic comparison of some of the great Italian operas and just share that with, with your family. Uh, explore the cuisines of different regions of Italy. I mean, we know all, everybody knows about pizza and pasta, but there's, there's all sorts of other wonderful things from uh, Piemonte and other regions of Italy. Uh, he and his wife love wine, so explore the wines of Italy. Everybody knows about Tusky and Chianti, but how about Barolo and Barbaresco uh, and some of the other regions. And then the great Italian artists. Obviously, you might want to start with Leonardo, but so get, get some big art, art books about Leonardo. Uh, uh, then do Michelangelo. Uh, go through the whole Renaissance. And then the philosophy and the design of Italy. So look at Ferrari and Lamborghini and Gucci and whatever, uh, Ferragamo. And you can keep you and your family busy and bring Italy into your lives. So they did this. He said, it, he said it was just so enriching. It was a family renaissance. And then do Japan. Go to China. The world is so amazing now. You can get access to the cultural treasures of the world. Bring them to your family for minimal expense. So once you know you could do this, why, why wouldn't you do this? I mean, so I, a lot of my clients, a lot of my friends, they, my wife, we do this. We're, we're just doing wine tastings. We're tasting different food. We're comparing chocolates. We're listening to incredible music. Uh, this is just what we do. How about teaching yourself languages? Once again, la bella lingua, Italia, uh, 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 italiano. This is, you can get, all close to free language learning. Now, having said that, I do really recommend going to the place. Mm -hmm. Go to the place. I mean, we, we aim to get to Italy. We're, we're just there in June. Uh, just uh, uh, talking to my Italian client about creating another opportunity there. Uh, I'm already scheming you know, for next year. I'm going to be in Vienna for a conference. So we're working on setting up some programs in Italy so we can be there because as wonderful it is to bring it to you and to learn on the uh, language programs and so on and so forth, which are amazing, being there is still the coolest thing. So find a way to get there, be there as much as you can, and then you, you, you learn by osmosis, which is the best way to learn a language. Absolutely. So let's let's dive into seven real briefly here. Connessione. And yeah. how do we cultivate that in our lives? Connessione 
Connexioni means connections. Leonardo wrote in his notebook, everything connects to everything else. And he's looking at life in terms of relationships and connections. So in, in the book, there is a very powerful exercise called Make a Master Mind Map of Your Life. And it's based on the consulting I do with my business clients because you know, I have a company now in New Jersey and I, I, working with a team that we created and they're rewriting their purpose, their vision, their mission, their values, and their operating principles. And it's great because we got everybody in the company involved in this. Then we got the team and they're doing it all by making mind maps, sharing their mind maps. And why do companies do this? Because they're much more successful when everybody has a, a, a why, a reason to be there mm -hmm. and a sense of clarity of values and really clear goals. And we're meeting, I did a strategic planning meeting for them last year. We're doing another one in January and we're doing another one next year. And it's all done via mind map. And it's great because it builds the team and it builds the connections between the team. So I just thought, well, what if we just got the readers of how to think like Leonardo gave them the tools to do this themselves mm -hmm. so that they can. So, cause the real point is how do you make a connection connection between your highest ideal, your yeah. purpose and your vision, your mission, what you're really doing every day, your goals in life in the different areas and your values, the things you wouldn't change for any reason, for any amount of money about your, what you're committed to in terms of how you will treat other human beings. So if you work in a company, again, I work with a lot of CEOs. Their job is they're the stewards of, okay, we're going for the purpose and the mission. Uh, we want to create a new world of vision. We're, I'm monitoring that we're following our values. We're trying to achieve these goals while keeping all of this in mind. And there's always something that's out of alignment, that's not working. So the job of a leader is constantly be scanning to see where we're not living our ideals mm -hmm. and adjust and correct and provide education and training, provide incentive and compensation, recruit and hire different kinds of people who are more easily aligned with the vision that we're all trying to pursue. So that is, that's a healthy organization. It's not perfect, but it's constantly making adjustments to be more in align with the alignment with the true values. So the, this is the exercise in, in the Conezioni chapter that readers have told me over the years has changed their lives the most is we get you to use the mind map to define all these things and look at how it all fits together. And then you can see where's the greatest area for making an adjustment in your life so that your life is more connected with what you care about. And that's a continual process of adjustment, uh, whether it's for a company or for your own personal life. But that's, that's to me, the most powerful of the exercises in the Conezione chapter. Beautiful. Thank you. And so the, the 30 second connect back for those, those people who, who caught that when you got into colored pencils, I ended up winging us off track. We don't want to go with the outline that's, that's putting us in the box. We want to get these things down as, as bubbles, starting with a center idea. Is there anything else we need to think about as we start to put it on the page? Yes. Well, and, and instead of bubbles are fine, but that's more like webbing and mind okay. mapping is more precise. So in a mind map, you are going to print yep. keywords yep. on lines radiating out from your central image. And then you're going to use more images wherever you can think of them. The reason to print is that it makes it easier to read and you're going to get a lot of information and you want to be able to read it so you can can photograph it in your mind. This is also especially valuable if you're sharing it with other people. Why do you print on the lines? Because it shows the flow of your association and it helps to keep it integrated and organized even mm -hmm. as you let your mind go freely. Why do you draw more pictures? Because it stimulates the imaginative pictorial part of your mind and keeps that part alive even as you are using analytical thinking to decide what are the really important words, the key words. 
Now, having said that, go for quantity of expression. Don't worry about getting the rules right. Mm -hmm. It's better to just make a messy mind map in your first iteration. But another key point of mind mapping is you will iterate, iterate, iterate. So the mind map isn't over after you do the first version. That will stimulate your mind. You'll do the second version. It might be even messier. But then let's say you want to turn it into a plan for a book you want to write mm -hmm. or a vacation you want to take or a strategy for your business. Then you'll probably put it in clockwise rotation. You'll make it really neat and clear. You'll make stronger, more vivid, powerful images, and you'll put it up on your wall so you can – just get the big picture of what it is you're working on. Then you might translate it into an outline after all the thinking is done. And it will be a much neater, cleaner, more organized, intelligent outline. Just don't try to generate your ideas that way because it'll slow you down and, and shut down your creativity. You know, I never thought about it till this moment. But uh, and, and I've used ma uh, mind mapping quite a bit in the past, not so much recently, and you, you've challenged me. I'm going to go back to it right away. In fact, I can envision the nice big notebook, big, that I'm going to get for this. But I could write out my daily to-dos as oh, yeah. a mind map and have a much better visual representation where things don't get missed because you can see it all at once. That's, that's what this is. That's what I do every day. I make a mind map of my week. I make a mind map of each day. I make a mind map of the new book. I make a mind map. I have a, a, a tip sign. This guy's coming over for his business meeting tomorrow. Here's the mind map. And you, you may not be able to see this very clearly, but you see my, my central image. This yep. is another image. Uh, here's another image because we, we have a musical project. We have an investment project. Uh, we have uh, – I was talking to him about – helping me with one of my promote one of my books this is a company we're we're, we're starting and this is a, a key point with an asterisk to emphasize it uh, this is a newsletter we're working on i drew a little picture of a clock because uh, i want to ask him about when you know what's our timeline what's our actual deadline for getting this done so it's an amazing amount of information in a small space displayed in a fashion that makes it really easy to remember and it's way more fun. It's just way more fun. Yeah. I mean, way more fun. So then it doesn't feel like work. It feels like, I mean, to me, work and play really aren't separate and mind mapping is a big part of what makes that possible. And, you, know, you can get the benefits of just doing nonlinear note taking and webbing and putting things in bubbles and going. But I, 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 I will tell you that if you if you go through the specific rules of how to do mind mapping, as originated by Tony Buzan, I, you know, I started working with him in 1975. In the early 80s, I introduced mind mapping in the United States in a series of three-day seminars called High Performance Learning. I did them in 14 cities. We had hundreds of people. And I've been guiding people to do this uh, in all sorts of walks of life, from schools to big companies. It's a secret how I've written all my books, but I also, over there on my bookshelf, there are just shelves and shelves of books that people have sent me, which are their first book they wrote. And the thing that bridged the gap for them from, oh, gee, I don't know if I could ever write, to, wow, I'm an author, is mind mapping. Because it gets you to generate your ideas. It really wakes up art and science together in your mind, really gets you to think more like Leonardo da Vinci. And here's the good news is the more you do it, the more you're mind mapping by hand like this with colors in the way I, sh I shared with you, the more your brain is seeing this and being inspired to think in this connezione, integrated, engaging, energizing fashion. And that stimulates your curiosità. So you see Full how it all, it all fits together, yeah. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And it is, my first book was done with mind mapping. That was the 
only way I was going to be able to take my mind of that time and be able to get it out and see how the pieces fit together. Beautiful. What one homework assignment would you give people today to begin thinking like Leonardo da Vinci? Learn mind mapping. Just learn mind mapping. I mean, it's, you know, it's in, in the book, How to Think Like Leonardo is a great way to, to get started. Uh, Tony Buzan wrote a book called The Mind Map Book, mm -hmm. which is kind of the Bible of mind mapping. Uh, so learn mind mapping. That's, that is, I mean, we've, there's a reason we've talked about it a lot through this conversation because it really translates this into practice. I love it. And and like I said, I'm going to be going back to it a lot more. I'm, I'm never without my notebooks, but um, it's funny when you sometimes forget something that you know, and it's been such a powerful tool and then you get away from it and then the universe hooks you and brings you right back to it. Yes. Well, you know, the other things you've been working with this other really powerful tool of automatic writing, stream of consciousness writing, which is the other most powerful way I've discovered for getting ideas that are way, way, way beyond what your normal everyday yada yada mind would ever get. Thank you. Well, what advice would you give parents today to help their kids discover their inner genius and think like Leonardo da Vinci? Yes. So parent, what parents must do is embody the seven da Vinci principles themselves. It doesn't matter what you tell your kids to do. They're going to look at what you do. So I, I have parents. In the book, I have a section on each principle for curiosità for parents, sensazione for parents, dimostrazione for parents. But what's really apparent is <laughs> you must model this yourself. If you're really curious, if you're thinking for yourself, if you're a critical thinker, if you're bringing in Mozart and listening and sh guiding everybody to listen and share their experience, if you're able to smile like the Mona Lisa in the face of uncertainty, if you're mind mapping, if you're practicing the principles for integrating body and mind, if you are a systems thinker, your children will witness that and that will teach them more profoundly than anything you say. Woohoo! Thank you. On that note, question I've asked before, got to ask it again. What personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> well, part of it is definitely when we're just seeing the light go off in people's eyes when they get that they have this unlimited creative power. Uh, when uh, you know we were talking earlier about you thought you couldn't draw and when i see somebody realize oh maybe i can draw when you thought you know you couldn't learn how to swim oh wait maybe i can swim oh you thought you couldn't sing oh wait maybe i can sing maybe i can learn anything i've ever dreamed of learning maybe i can learn that language maybe i can learn that musical instrument maybe i can learn that software program <laughs> whatever whatever it is when you realize you have an effectively infinite instrument available mm -hmm. for learning and creating it, it just didn't come with a manual that that's now why i wrote the book <laughs> <laughs> okay perfect segue where can people go to find your beautiful book to find out more and uh, upcoming events. Yes. So best place to go is my website, michaelgelb.com. That's G-E-L-B. And there's lots of information about all my books. There's free video. There's free articles. There's a, a newsletter that's free people can sign up for. And of course, they can order How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci on the link where it says resources on my site. And January 1st to the 5th, out in California, in Santa Cruz, at a place mm -hmm. called 1440 Multiversity, I'm doing a seminar called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. And it'll be that week, the 1st to the 5th, immersion in the teachings of the maestro. 
And we will be doing chocolate tasting and wine tasting and communing with nature and listening to amazing music and learning mind maps and making mind maps of our lives. So what a great way to start the year, make a mind map of your life to start the year. So that's January 1st to the 5th at 1440 Multiversity. Do you do that annually? Uh, well, I usually, I, I used to do it at Esalen, mm -hmm. Esalen Institute. But this year I decided to try 1440 for the, uh, for the Da Vinci class. And I'm going from 1440 to Esalen to teach a weekend on the Art of Connection, the new book. So if people really want to start the year with a renaissance, they can come to 1440 for Da Vinci and then come with me down to Esalen for the Art of Connection. That's January 5th to 7th. And if people want information about those or have questions, they can also just write to me directly at Michael at michaelgelb.com. Fantastic. And before we go into a, a short meditation, any last words of wisdom you want to share, Michael? Well, just that you are, every child is gifted with potential far greater than we're, we're prepared to, to understand as a culture, as a society. And if you recognize that you are that child, we all are. So yes, we, you know, we all care passionately about the next generation, but it's not too late for this generation, however old you are. Leonardo da Vinci said, iron rusts from disuse. Water that does not flow becomes stagnant. Thus it is with the human mind. So let it flow and the potential is virtually infinite. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been so, so much fun. Do you have time for a uh, short meditation of your calling? Sure. Sure. So if you're sitting, you want to sit with your feet flat on the floor, mm -hmm. balanced on your sitting bones, aligned around the vertical axis. Eyes can either be closed or soft, open peripheral vision. If you say out loud the, the phrase, let go, say, let go, let go, let go. And you notice where your tongue goes when you say, la, la, that's the acupuncture point that connects the energy flow down the front of your body and up the back of your body. So allow your tongue to rest on that point. Now, here's our little meditation. It's just going to be to think of the Mona Lisa. And smile like the Mona Lisa. So what is she smiling about? You're going to embody the smile of the Mona Lisa. And you notice that that smile has an energy that comes with it. It's a smile so subtle that people may not even know you're smiling, which is wonderful because then you can access it anytime, whatever the external circumstance. So you're smiling like the Mona Lisa, and you feel that energy, just a kind of witty, playful, amused. It's a smile that doesn't take anything personally. <laughs> right? That just sees the paradoxical nature of things, even in times of uncertainty. As a matter of fact, especially in times of uncertainty, smile like Mona. And then you can take the energy of that smile and just smile to your own heart and your whole cardiovascular system. Smile to your brain and your whole nervous system. Smile to all your internal organs. Smile to your bones, your muscles, your connective tissue.
Smile to all the cells of your body. And then smile to the molecules that make up the cells. Smile to the atoms that make up the molecules. And smile to the subatomic particles that make up the atoms. And smile to the pure emptiness and energy that makes up the particles. Then smile to the space around you and smile to the whole dwelling in which you may be at the moment. And then the city, smile to everyone and every sentient being in your city and in your state. And smile to your country and to the whole planet. And then extend the energy of your smile out to the whole solar system and beyond to the edge of the galaxy. And then to the whole universe. And now imagine the whole universe smiling back at you. And as you inhale, draw the energy of that smile into your lower belly. A small pearl-like sphere at the center of your lower belly. The whole universe smiling back at you. Breathe into your lower belly. Breathe into that pearl. And smile. So there's our Mona Lisa inner smile, cosmic smile practice. <laughs> I call that the Mona Lisa smile, uh, meta smile meditation. Thank you so much, Michael. As always, this has been amazing. This has been a treat. Everybody, 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 you're going to want to go out. And if you have kids, it's a requirement. You're going to want to go out and get How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. It will empower you. It will challenge you. And you will get, get you not only genius thinking, but this is part of genius thinking, with more playfulness and joy in your life. Thank you so much, Michael. Pleasure as always. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, and begin discovering your inner genius today, and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> I love your laugh. <laughs> Takes one to know one. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>